Hello everyone! This video is about treatments for vitiligo. Please notice that the first part from the series was about causes of vitiligo, and it might be beneficial for you to watch it first, the link is below, to better understand the connection between cause and treatment. Also, I would like to stress that this video is strictly about treatments, that is, all the ways in which monocytes, that is, the cells that produce the skin pigment, can be repopulated in the skin. We are not going to talk about masking or coping strategies like bleaching or micropigmentation. If you are interested, my next video will be about micropigmentation, so if you don't want to miss on that, please subscribe. So, let's start. Currently, there are three well-established modalities of treatment for vitiligo – immunomodulating agents, phototherapy and surgical treatments. The aim of both phototherapy and medications is to stimulate the repigmentation in the affected areas, whereas in the case of surgical treatments, the aim is to replenish the affected area with some active malocytes from unaffected skin. This modality is only available for stable, that is, non-expanding vitiligo. Later in the video, we will define stability of vitiligo in more details. Now, as I said, there are three most common modalities of treatments, but there is another strategy – antioxidants. Some of the tested antioxidants are reported to have statistically significant higher effect than placebo, but I'm not going to address them here because I already mentioned them when I was talking about an oxidative stress as a cause of vitiligo in the previous video. The link is in the description. Currently, trials with antioxidants are not promising enough to use them as a standalone therapy. However, you might discuss with your dermatologist and combine antioxidants, say, with phototherapy. Which brings us to the last point on the slide – various modalities of treatments are often combined, and when they are combined, they tend to bring better results. So first, let's focus on phototherapy and medications, and specifically on the basic principle of repigmentation mechanism. So here we can see a paper from 80s, it's a trial on one of the first medications for vitiligo. We read, the first sign of response to treatment was the appearance of perifollicular islands of pigment around the normally pigmented hairs in the area of vitiligo. So here is a cross-section of vitiligial skin, we see some hair, they are pigmented, and so as a result of treatment, there appear islands of pigmented patches around the hair and they grow and coalesce. This is a diagram from above, so the black spots are pigmented hair, and again, the pigmented spots appear around the hair and spread. Additionally, as the authors of the paper point out, the pigment from the margins of the lesions also spread out and reduced the vitiligious area. This observation repeats for all use medications and in the case of phototherapy. So, what is going on? This is a diagram from a more current research. It's a hair follicle, this region is a hair bulge. Hair bulge contains melanocyte stem cells and melanoblasts both precursors for melanocytes. A quick reminder, melanocytes are the cells that produce the skin pigment, and in the vitiligial skin, they are missing, or if there are few left, they do not function correctly. So the current theory is that, as a result of radiation or certain medications, melanocytes in the hair bulge become activated, migrate from the hair bulge upwards, and repopulate the epidermis, that is, the upper layer of the skin. This mechanism can make you wonder about two specific cases. What if the skin is lacking hair follicles, and what if the hair in the affected area is white as well? Well, if the affected area is lacking hair follicles, like on palm, sole, or mucosal surface, then sadly, it is much harder to stimulate significant repigmentation. Similarly, when hair on the affected area is white, the treatment is also currently more difficult. However, it seems that it is not due to the absence of melanocytes. This publication claims that melanocytes can be detected in vitiligious white hair, but due to an interruption in some signaling. This actually might be good news, but still, more research is needed in order to efficiently repigment vitiligious skin with white hair. 
So now we will dive deeper into each of the three well-established modalities of treatment for vitiligo. Let's start with immunomodulating agents. The rationale behind this treatment is that autoimmune response is one of the main causes of vitiligo. We discussed that in more details in the previous video. So anyway, the purpose of immunomodulating agents is to inhibit immune reaction against melanocytes. Immunomodulating agents can be administrated in the form of tablets or ointment creams. In the latter case, the immunosuppression is restricted to the area affected by vitiligo, which in general tends to be more desirable. Immunomodulating agents can be introduced when the vitiligo is active, that is, expanding. If at this stage they don't cause repigmentation, although it's quite likely, then at least in vast majority of cases they will arrest the expansion of vitiligo. Corticosteroids were the first generation of medications applied for vitiligo, but the side effects were the main reason why their use is now in decline. Then we have calcineurin inhibitors. Topical calcineurin inhibitors, TCI in short, is probably the most standard vitiligo medication at present. And lastly, there are some emerging new generations of medications, like JAK inhibitors, however, they are still currently in trials. So let's start with corticosteroids. I'm not going to go through the initial research on corticosteroids because the results are not very consistent, largely because the research on vitiligo was still at a very early stage and people did not know some basic facts, like for instance that the success of repigmentation depends on the area of the body affected by vitiligo and the time that passed from the onset. Also, there was no standardized definitions that helped describing vitiligo, etc. And to be fair, even nowadays, there often exists considerable discrepancy between research findings due to the same reasons, not to mention that doses, concentrations, and the most useful types of corticosteroids needed to be identified. So anyway, let's just focus on the research from 1984, which seems to cement it, the role of topical corticosteroids, clobetasol propionate, in the treatment of vitiligo. First, please notice that the study spanned over three years. Nowadays, usually a study would last four to six months, occasionally a year. So it's difficult to compare a study that lasts four months to a study that lasts three years. So anyway, 75 patients took part in the study, repigmentation of 90% to 100% was achieved in more than 80% of patients with vitiligo on face and more than 40% of patients with vitiligo on other parts parts of the body. However, what are the problems of adverse local effects? Here, yeah, this is not a trifle. Uh, the adverse effect of topical corticosteroids is skin atrophy, that is, skin degradation. And so this particular study, for instance, was designed so that only small area of vitiligo was treated at a time. That is the main reason why the study took so long. An extra caution was paid when treated areas were face or neck, because skin in these areas is thin and delicate. So this is just a summary regarding topical corticosteroids. Please notice that topical corticosteroids should be avoided when treating children, because children have thinner skin. One way to avoid skin atrophy is to use corticosteroids as tablets, rather than ointment. However, even in these cases, some side effects are present, as we can see from this table. Even though a high percentage of patients experienced repigmentation, and even though the side effects were described as minimal, other medications started to be tested for the treatment of vitiligo. And that's where calcineurin inhibitors come to play. Two most common calcineurin inhibitors are tacrolimus and pimecrolimus, and this study is a meta-analysis, means that this publication is a statistical analysis that combines the results of multiple scientific studies. Anyway, we read that the primary outcomes were the rates of at least mild, 25, at least moderate, 50%, and marked 75% repigmentation responses to treatment. The study concludes that calcineurin inhibitors should be encouraged in patients with vitiligo. So let's step back for a moment. We already discussed 
cancer neurin inhibitors, and corticosteroids. So when efficiency of these two is compared, often this paper is quoted. Study on 20 children, 90% of them experienced some repigmentation. The mean percentage of repigmentation was about 50% for clobesterol, which is corticosteroid, and about 40% for tachromas, which is a calcium urine inhibitor. Here we can see an example, right eye was treated with corticosteroids and left with calcium urine inhibitor, and both produced more than 75% repigmentation. So overall, the efficiency seems to be comparable, even though corticosteroids might give marginally better response in the same amount of time. Please notice, however, that some side effects were present. Even though to reduce adverse effects, the study lasted for only two months rather than typical four, and the patients were under close observation. The paper concludes that acrylomus, the calcium neuron inhibitor, does not produce skin atrophy and therefore is more suitable for children than corticosteroids. So let's move on to the new generation of medications for vitiligo. I'm only going to mention one, Janus kinase inhibitor. This seems to be one of the first studies. From 2017, the findings are promising, but the sample group is indeed small and the study is open-label, meaning that both health providers and the patients were aware of the drug being given. This study had 157 participants, the trial lasted for a year, and no serious treatment-related adverse effects were noted. The study split the participants into smaller groups and varied the percentage of active substance in the ointment. The study concluded that substantial repigmentation was achieved and that roxolitinib, which is Janus kinase inhibitor, might be an effective treatment for vitiligo. Before we move on, please notice that the study was funded by Insight which is a pharmaceutical company. Some objections follow the study. This publication lists few, that there are not enough young people in the study and people with black skin type, and hence the generalizability of the findings can be questioned. Moreover, the authors voiced what seems to be more severe objection, that darker skin patients are more likely to have concurrent autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis is associated with an increased risk of thrombosis with Janus kinase inhibitor. Thrombosis, in case you have not heard it before, occurs when blood clots block veins and arteries. So authors pointed out that the systemic exposure to topical roxolitinib by application to more than 10% of body surface area, or a total of 3.75 gram, could impose an increased risk of thrombosis in black patients with vitiligo. Now I feel a strong urge to find some papers that support this sentence. Vitiligo does coexist with other autoimmune conditions, we already said that in a previous video. Is rheumatoid arthritis one of them? In this paper from 2003, no connection was found between vitiligo and rheumatoid arthritis. The sample group was significant, but more than 80% of participants were Caucasian. In this publication from 2013, Caucasian constituted below 50% of participants, the size of the sample group was also significant, and the link seems to exist. Furthermore, the paper states that rheumatoid arthritis seems to be more common among African American. So this seems to cover the first part of the sentence. How about link between rheumatoid arthritis and thrombosis? The link has been discussed in the literature for several years, which eventually led to risk warnings from licensing authorities like WHO or FDA. However, a very recent meta-analysis was published which does not support current warnings around VTE risk for Janus kinase inhibitor. However, the report admits that given the low event rates and thus precision of the data, a true effect involving a small increase in risk cannot be ruled out, and that patients at the highest risk of VTE, such as old age, obesity, immobilization, medical history of PE, DVT, may be underrepresented in the randomized control trials, so extrapolation of the findings to these populations must be done cautiously. So anyway, coming back to the main article, it did highlight some weak points of the study on Janus kinase inhibitor for vitiligo. The authors replied, defending the study design. 
However, critical appraisal of the original study followed. Critical appraisal is the process of carefully and systematically examining research to judge its trustworthiness and its value and relevance in a particular context. Quite a few objections to the study design were found. There was lack of prospective validation, which as far as I can gather, there usually is like a small-scale test in which researchers choose the most optimal strategy for the actual bigger-scale research. There is no mention of that in the study. The target of 50% of repigmentation were used, even though the standard is 75%. It is true that at the time of the study, 75% was not formally agreed on, but the paper points out that at the time of the study, there existed other tools that helped researchers to identify the success of a treatment, like vitiligo impact patient scale, etc., but they were chosen not to be utilized in the study. However, the critical appraisal concludes, overall, the authors have reported a well-designed trial for this new treatment of vitiligo and its efficiency and safety have been confirmed. However, it remains unclear where roxolitinib cream will fit into current practice and it's hard to meaningfully compare this treatment with others. In other words, more research is needed. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned for the next part on phototherapy. Bye!